Hey y'all, welcome to the channel. Today we're checking out the North Sea Explained. What is that? In the northeast of the Atlantic Ocean, bound by the island of Great Britain, the Norwegian coast, Denmark's Jylland, and the coasts of Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, and France, lies the North Sea. Home to Northern Europe's most busiest trade routes, historic battlefields, and a source of economic success. This marginal mm. sea is full of geographical anomalies, treasures buried deep under the seafloor, and a convoluted history which has shaped the European nations for thousands of years. Hmm. In this video, we'll dive deep into all of these aspects and uncover what makes the North Sea so special. Yeah, I don't really know much about the North Sea. It is in a place where people have been doing people stuff for a long time. I can only imagine all the battles that have happened there. I mean, between England and France and Germany, Denmark, Norway, there's a lot going on there. I've always heard that it's uh, really cold and rough seas, and apparently it has oil. What are y'all gonna do with that oil? Chapter one, geography of the North Sea. Okay. Just east of the Channel Tunnel, at the inconspicuous Leathercote Point in England and the Waldy Lighthouse in France, the almost mythical North Sea starts to spread out for over half a million square kilometers or 220 square miles across the flat European continental shelf. Over this wow. vast area, the North Sea has a diverse bathymetry, meaning the topography of the seabed, and coastal landscapes range from dramatic fjords over towering dunes to mudflats and chocolate. Leather coat point. Show me on a map. Leather coat point. Wow. It looks like there's not a whole lot there. There aren't even photos. If I drop a pin, here, what does it look like? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, it's a big cliff. Okay. Can you see France from there? Looks like there's something back there. Oh, it's a ship. Oh, look at that. Wow. I've, oh, who's this person? Oh, God. Hippies are everywhere. I've heard that the Romans could see the cliffs of Dover across the channel, and it's what made them want to. Let's uh, check out the French side. If I drop a in here, what's it look like? Oh, they got, oh, look at that. Razor wire, fences. Hmm, interesting. It looks very manicured. Interesting. And coastal landscapes range from dramatic fjords over towering dunes to mudflats and chocolate. What is a fjord? Fjord? Is that how you spell it? Oh, it's the name of a post-hardcore German band. What one does it mean? Oh, fjord with a D, a narrow inlet of the sea between cliffs. Okay, all right. The first section of the North Sea is the Southern Bight. It is characterized by its enormous marine traffic, connecting England and Central Europe with the rest of the world. Four of the largest okay. ports of Europe exit into the Southern Bight, with the ports of Rotterdam and Antwerp being the largest and second largest ports by annual cargo tonnage of the entire continent. Following the Dutch coast northeastwards, we arrive at the Frisian Front, a 450 kilometer long archipelago with flat and sandy dune islands stretching all along the German Bight. Frisian Front. What does it look like on the ground? Right? Yes. Let's drop a pin here. Oh, wow. It looks very similar to the British side, doesn't it? I mean, it's probably the same temperate zone and all that stuff. Some houses over there. Oh, wow, those are very Dutch-looking houses with the roofs. Cool. About 12,000 years ago, during the last glacial maximum, the sea level lays about 60 meters or 200 feet below today's levels. Oh, wow. And a dense network of towering dunes covered the depression in front of Germany's coast. With rising sea levels, the water eventually broke through the natural dikes in several locations, flooding the area behind it and leaving a series of islands as remnants of the once dry land. Huh. These islands give shelter to the mudflats called the Wadden Sea, which spreads along the Dutch, German, and Danish coastline. The region is considered an intertidal zone, meaning that it is flooded during high tides, but exposed by the retreating waters during every tidal cycle. Wow. These patterns have created one of the most diverse ecosystems in Northern Europe, with hundreds of thousands of geese, ducks, waders, seagulls, and herons preying on small invertebrate and fish. So they're like mud flaps, mud mud flats all along here. Yeah. 
So sometimes there's like land here and sometimes it's mud. Drop a pin. I mean, it's a little town. This looks like a British town to me. Other than the roofs, the houses are slightly different, but it looks in Johansen, northernmost point of Germany. What is this? Wait, so that's Germany. This is something different? Rome Bilstrand. Ah, oh, there we go. People partying out. That's a huge beach, isn't it? I mean, I guess that's the mud flats. Maybe the water comes up higher. Interesting. Anyway, moving on. Tell me more. Continuing from the sandy beaches of Jylland, the scenery drastically changes once we cross the Skagerrak, the strait connecting the north to the Baltic Sea. Instead of lush dunes, we are greeted by a rocky coastline, dominated by small islands and narrow inlets. We gotta see a picture of it. Just show us that. So this is U Uland, Jutland. Let's just check this out. Oh yeah, there's a lot of little islands. Let's drop a pin here. Oh wow, yeah. Oh, very rocky, snowy. Wow, lots of little islands like that. Very cool, very scenic. That's all that. That's crazy. Hills and then mountains, creating the fascinating fjord landscape of Norway. Sheer cliffs of hundreds of meters plunging into salmon-filled trenches are already hinting at the seascape that lies just before the fjords. Stretching from Oslo to Bergen, the up to 700 meter or 2,300 feet deep Norwegian trench marks the wow. deepest point of the North Sea which geologists assume used to act as a highway for our glacial ice masses that were pushed from the Scandinavian mainland along the shore. Glacial land masses? It was a long time ago, huh? Where are we here? So it's over here. That is super deep, right? What happens when we get over to Bergen? What is that all about? They have an airport. There are little roads that run through all these fjords. Let's drop a pin on this bridge. Beautiful. Wow. Very cool. Is there a restaurant here? There's a restaurant here. Glesaver Cafe Og Catering. Okay. The world? Ah. Oh. Sculptures. Let's drop a pin on this. Ah. Old people boating. It's like Florida. What are you eating? Oh. A little salad. It's like uh, probably some salmon. Yeah. It's got a nice sleeves on both arms. Homosexuals are accepted over there. That's good. What are all these people waiting for? Old people just sitting around next to the water. I hope I make it to that age where I can just sit around next to the water. You know? Now, what are, can I check out these islands? Guess not. There's so many islands. Gosh, somebody has to keep track of them all. Probably some nerdy professor at a college. Wow, the landscape is so interesting. There's all these rocks popping up. Look at that. Wow, beautiful, beautiful. Sorry to digress, but moving on. The trench eventually leads to the deeper waters of the Norwegian Sea, which is separated from the North Sea by the 61st degree north. To the west, the Shetland and Orkney Islands of Scotland continue the boundary of the North Sea, and okay. similarly to the Norwegian shore, the coastal strips are rugged and mountainous. The seabed in front of the Scottish and English coasts is scattered with several sandbanks and trenches which deviate in depth from just a few meters on the banks to over 450 meters, or 1,500 feet, at the deepest points around wow. Devil's Hole. Many of these trenches are believed to have been eroded riverbeds during previous ice ages, while the sandbanks used to be moraines, meaning an accumulation of debris collected by glaciers moving over the surface. Okay. The last significant bathymetric feature of the North Sea, before returning to the English Channel, is the Dogger Bank, a massive sandbank bending over 260 by 100 kilometers across uh -huh. the southwestern part of the North Sea. That's gigantic. With the shallowest bits only laying 50 meters or 50 feet under the sea level. The sandbank is one of the most productive marine life habitats and has been exploited as such for hundreds of years. For equally as long, the Dogger Bank and practically the entire North Sea have been a battleground for European powers ever since the Roman conquest of Britain in 43 CE. Countless wars have been fought on its waters and trade routes have connected the people of Northern Europe, bringing us to chapter two. So the Dogger Bank, it must have so much life because of the water pressure? Dogger Bank is a large sandbank in a shallow area of the North Sea. During the last ice age, the bank was part of a large landmass connecting mainland Europe and the British Isles, now known as Doggerland. 
It has long been known by fishermen to be a productive fishing bank. It was named after the Doggers, medieval Dutch fishing boats especially used for catching cod. At the beginning of the 21st century, oh, the UK might put a wind farm there. Wow, there, there are some battles there. There's two battles of Dogger Bank, one in 1696, one in 1781. The Dogger Bank in incident? I guess that's what the video is going to tell us next in the history. That's a giant area, 161 square miles. Crazy. For thousands of years, the North Sea has connected and divided the many nations around it, and the sea has often played a pivotal role in the wars of the continent. As early as the Roman Empire, when southern Britain was formally invaded by Emperor Claudius, ports and trade routes were set up spanning from the European mainland to southern Britain. For the following centuries, there has been a reoccurring connection between who held naval supremacy over the North Sea and who was the dominating regional power of Northern Europe. Okay. After the collapse of the Roman Empire, the Vikings were the next dominating force, taming the North Sea with their slim and agile rowing boats and extending their reach to anything accessible by boat. Okay, so he's saying whoever controls the North Sea controls Europe. Makes sense. So these are where the Vikings attacked? So in the 8th century, Norway and Sweden, I guess, and 9th century. That's a long time. It's 100 years built apart. The 10th century over Eastern Europe, and then 11th century Britain or Wales. Wow. In response to the Scandinavians plundering villages and ports across the North and Baltic Sea, even protruding up the massive rivers of Central Europe, merchant guilds oh, really? in Northern Germany started cooperating in their trade ambitions and organized protected trading ports and trade routes along the seas. Oh. The exact origins of the Hanseatic League are not known since there was not a single event leading to its establishment. Instead, the network of merchants simply continued growing over the centuries, finding new allies in various trading ports and eventually covering most coastal cities in northern Germany, the Netherlands and today's Belgium. During the climax of the Hanseatic League, their influence reached from London to the Russian Novgorod and their political and economic influence rivaled those of contemporary nations. Technological advances in shipbuilding and navigation led to the Dutch and later the British becoming oceanic seafaring nations, gradually overtaking the Hanseatic League's significance in the North Sea and setting the foundation for their respective global empires. By the end of the 17th century, the British achieved naval supremacy over European waters, including the North Sea, which has stayed this way until the 20th century. The North Sea was moved into the spotlight once again during the World Wars, where it presented a weak spot for the German war effort since it was the only oceanic supply route. Ah. With a shift from naval battles to a blockade strategy, the Allies managed to severely hinder German supply lines in both wars, having a significant impact on the outcome of the war. With the Smart. We did it, y'all. It is crazy to think about how the Dutch were so powerful for in, in trade for a long time. But when you look at it like this, in terms of the North Sea and trading routes, they're right in the middle of it. It makes sense. They have all that coastline, a lot of places to store boats. Makes sense. I get it. That's so much land. I mean, vast distances of all these coastlines and all these tiny little islands and rivers that go deep into... That's... Wow. Never really thought of it like that. I didn't think the Vikings were going to inland, to inland areas through rivers, you know? Don't really think about that. With the end of the Second World War, the North Sea transitioned into a new era, and for the first time since civilization spread around its shores, all constituting nations were part of the same alliance, the NATO. This new oh. era has brought with it a dramatic shift from seeing the North Sea as a strategic military aspect to it being, first and foremost, a vessel for trade, communication, and economic development. This development was even more accelerated when a black and sticky treasure was first discovered lurking under the seabed. Cheers to NATO. We did it. We're doing it. F Russia. Bringing us to chapter 3. Oil in the North Sea. Post-war Western Europe saw a dramatic cultural shift with rapid reindustrialization, increased yes. consumerism, yes. and the rise of the private automobile, which created a never-ending thirst for oil. The yes. very sparse domestic productions in the UK and some parts of Germany weren't even close to keeping up with these needs, and Western Europe quickly became heavily reliant on oil imports from the Middle East. This dynamic, however, completely shifted when the Netherlands stuck natural gas at the Groningen gas field in 1959 in the northeast of the country. The reservoir, at the depth of around 3,000 meters or 10,000 feet, 
sparked the interest of many Northern European countries, since it meant that there is the possibility oh. for further fossil fuel discoveries on the continental shelf, especially Norway. What and year the was UK. that? The what year was that? Groningen gas field. The Groningen gas field is a natural gas. Northeast province, largest natural gas field in Europe and one of the largest in the world. The gas field was discovered in 1959. Okay, not that long ago, relatively. This is natural gas, not oil. Initially, it was expected that nuclear energy would eventually replace the use of natural gas. It is not yet. The first earthquake induced by a Dutch natural gas field occurred in 1986. So taking that gas out of there is making the ground go crazy. So this is a monument called the gas molecule. This is a monument. I guess that's the hole in the ground that they dug. Okay. All right. Yeah. Especially Norway and the UK. The two countries with the largest EEZ in the North Sea started oh. extensive exploration campaigns, drilling hundreds of holes during the following years. It took Norway over 200 attempts at various locations oh, across gosh. the North Sea. But in 1969, the fate of this rather insignificant nation changed forever. Almost at the center of the North Sea, where the EEZ of Norway, the UK, the Netherlands, Germany and Denmark meet, Norway discovered one of the largest oil reserves of the North Sea. Called That's, the Ecofisk oil field. Seems like it's this about discovery to cause trouble. turned Norway from a simple fish and timber based economy to one of the largest and richest oil producers in the world. Really? And the UK quickly followed suit in their discoveries. In the 30 years following the installation of the first drilling platforms, production has skyrocketed. Oh, wow, and that's Norway a lot. has quickly achieved one of the highest oil production rates per capita in the world, bringing incredible wealth and prosperity to the nation. As but the oil and Saudi gas Arabia. expedition hasn't always been a fairy tale wow. for the people working offshore. Many disasters across the past 60 years have cost the lives of hundreds of workers. From mm. explosions of oil rigs like the Piper Alpha, which took 165 lives in 1988, to storms Whoa. and rogue waves catching the platforms, the North Sea can be a very threatening place. While the shallow depth yeah. may seem like an advantage at first sight, the interplay between the shallow depth, strong tides and storm surges that rush into the North Sea from the Atlantic, amplify storm waves, creating a very hazardous environment. Can you imagine trying to drill an oil well and build an oil platform with those waves like that? How do you do that? Like, that's a feat. My God. That's more of a feat than probably the Eiffel Tower or the Statue of Liberty. Also, the fossil fuels in the North Sea are not endless. And as we all know, they are not replenishable on a human timescale. True. Since the beginning of the extraction, it is approximated that 60 to 80 percent of all accessible oil has been taken from the rocks. Uh -huh. the yep, you know, it's just dead dinosaurs and there aren't any more dead dinosaurs. We're eventually going to run out of dead dinosaurs unless Jurassic Park happens for real. Let's get to work on that, scientists. The combination of these factors, which make oil extraction more costly, combined with a rising consciousness about the abysmal impacts of fossil fuels on our climate, is leading to an inevitable decline in production capacity since the turn of the millennium. Okay. With the oil and gas era coming to an end in the North Sea, the next industry is already on the rise trying to take its spot. Year by year, new wind parks are popping up in front of the shores of the North Sea countries, okay. and new mega projects on the Dogger Bank and the Horn Sea Zone are underway, guaranteeing a continuing rapid growth of the industry, and once again having the North Sea supply Europe with energy. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I guess lots of high winds. You would want to put a wind farm there. What's the top wind speed? Analysis of wind speed observations in the North Sea coast. Oh, this is a scientific journal. I'm not going to read all that. Here we go. Google Groups. I'm curious about North Sea wave heights generated by North Sea wind. Apparently 142 miles per hour has been recorded. Highest wave recorded was in 1995. 85 feet. Crest to trough. 85 foot wave. That'll kill you. It's hard to visualize that. How high is 85 feet? Like, show me. 10 things that are about 85 feet. Okay, great. <laughs> Half as tall as Nelson's column. I don't know what that is. Length between baseball bases. Okay. 4.2 times the elevation of Niagara Falls. Four Niagara Falls. A dreadnoughtus 
Scrawny. I don't know what that is. Never seen one in person. The width of Noah's Ark. How do we know what the width of Noah's Ark was? Like, oh, well, I guess from the Bible, they say, right? That's 85 feet. I've never been there. UNESCO headquarters. Okay, it's as tall as a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight story building. This is great, though. Wind farms in the North Sea seems like a smart thing. Very interesting video. I know it's a little boring. If you made it this far, I want to say thank you. And uh, thank you for watching this boring video with me. And I'll see you next time. Later.